Hello everyone, today we're going to cover the Vietnam War. Uh, before we get started, I've got some guided notes. They look like this. So if you want to print these off and follow along as we go throughout these lectures, uh, it kind of has important events and people and has a map that you can kind of reference. Now the books that I use to create this lecture or these lectures, the first one is called Vietnam A History by Stanley Carnow. Um, it's kind of just a general history of the Vietnam War. The other book I used is called Triumph Forsaken, The Vietnam War 1954 to 1965 by Mark Moyer. This is kind of a revisionist history of the Vietnam War, so it kind of takes a different approach than the, than the other book I used. But they're both pretty good. I would kind of read them together if you're more interested in, in learning about the Vietnam War. Uh, those are two good resources that you can kind of look into. Now, the Vietnam War, depending on what year one uses, was or is the longest war in American history. Some place the years from 1955, when America took over after the French were expelled, to 1975, when Saigon fell. That's a span of 20 years. If you place the starting date at 1965, when Americans started to have an official combat role, to the fall of Saigon, the war lasted 10 years. Now, the Afghanistan War, begun in 2001 after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, is still currently going on 19 years later, um, as of 2020. It probably will become the longest war in American history if things continue the same way. Approximately 2.5 million Americans served in Vietnam. The war killed about 58,000 Americans and wounded over 300,000. It divided the American public more than any other war except for the Civil War, fought a century earlier. Now, the Vietnam War had deep roots that go all the way back to the 19th century when the French seized Vietnam. The Vietnamese had always resisted the French, but after World War II, that resistance increased. The result was the First Indochina War, which lasted from 1946 to 1954. This war pitted the French against the Viet Minh or the Vietnamese nationalists. The Viet Minh won that war and expelled the French. Now, this is when America's role in Vietnam began. The Second Indochina War, what we know as the Vietnam War, took place roughly from 1955 to 1975. This war pitted American and South Vietnamese forces against North Vietnam and the Viet Cong, or the Vietnamese Communists. Um, they're also referred to as the National Liberation Front, or the NLF. This war resulted in the Communist North Vietnam takeover of anti-communist South Vietnam in 1975. Now, the Vietnam War would be called Lyndon Johnson's War for reasons we'll see, but American presidents from FDR to Gerald Ford all had a hand in Vietnam. Even Herbert Hoover, who died in October 1964, even he would get in on the action. Um, he would come to the White House and talk to various presidents about policy in Vietnam. Now, I've got some quotes here by different presidents, both Republican and Democrat, showing support for South Vietnam and how that support was bipartisan. These quotes show the Cold War consensus in action. Both Republicans and Democrats, indeed most Americans, believe that the Cold War must be fought and won and communists either contained or ultimately defeated. So you can kind of read these quotes um, and see how uh, the Vietnam War is a bipartisan war. Americans of all political stripes or, or Republican and Democrat stripes support the war. Now, these quotes also show a fear of the domino theory coming true. The domino theory holds that if one nation, such as South Vietnam, fell to communist aggression, then neighboring countries would also fall to communism. So that's the fear. We don't want all of Southeast Asia to become communist. Now, to take a little bit, to talk a little bit about the roots of the Vietnam War, we have to go back to the 19th century. About the time America was engaged in its civil war, France was taking control of Indochina, which consisted of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Vietnam was divided into three parts, Cochin, China, Annam, and Tonkin. Now in the 1860s, France had a strong foothold in Indochina, and by 1885, Vietnam had lost its independence. Now fast forward to World War II. Uh, Japan ruled Vietnam during that war, but the Viet Minh resist and fight to establish an independent and united Vietnam. In this, they have America's support because America is also fighting Japan uh, during World War II. Now, the leader of North Vietnam throughout this whole period is Ho Chi Minh. Uh, his birth name was Nguyen Tat Tan. He was born around the year 1890, but we don't really know. 
He later used other names such as Nguyen I Kwok, which means Nguyen the Patriot, and Ho Chi Minh, which means he who enlightens. Ho Chi Minh is the name he is known to history by, so that's the name we'll use for him in this lecture. Now, he was in Paris in 1919 during the peace conference after World War I. He actually sought an audience with the leaders of the Paris Peace Conference to try and make his case for Vietnamese independence, but he was never given an audience by the Big Four or by Woodrow Wilson. History might have been totally different for America if Woodrow Wilson had sat down and talked with Ho in 1919. Now, during World War II, with France conquered by Hitler in Europe, Japan took control of Indochina. A group of Vietnamese nationalists known as the Viet Minh was established by Ho Chi Minh. They were anti-French and anti-Japanese nationalists who fought to free Vietnam from uh, foreign control. The United States dispatched a team to Vietnam to help train the Viet Minh. This was known as the Deer Mission. After the defeat of Japan at the end of World War II, Ho Chi Minh set up a government in Hanoi and declared the Democratic Republic of Vietnam on the same day that, that the Japanese surrendered aboard the USS Missouri. At the independence ceremony in Hanoi, Ho read from the Declaration of Independence the part about all men being created equal and guaranteed certain rights by their creator. Uh, and an American plane flew over during the celebration as the Vietnamese crowd cheered. Now, after World War II, there was trouble in Vietnam. The Allies had worked out the surrender of Japan by allowing the British to take their surrender in South Vietnam, uh, which was divided at the 16th parallel, while Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese nationalist, he was allowed to take their surrender in North Vietnam. What ended up happening is the French were let back into Vietnam for a time, while at the same time recognizing Vietnamese independence. So there's this kind of this weird phase after World War II. Shortly thereafter, France declared that South Vietnam was separate from the North. Negotiations between the Vietnamese and French broke down and the first Indochina War broke out in 1946. The French army controlled the cities of Vietnam and fought the Viet Minh who controlled the countryside. The French set up a puppet state in South Vietnam under the control of the Emperor Bao Dai. Now in 1950, Mao Zedong recognized Ho's government as the legitimate government in Vietnam. The Soviets followed and did likewise. Soon the Korean War broke out and it appeared that communism was on the march worldwide. So you have to keep that in, in mind as we talk about Vietnam. Now the United States threw its support behind the anti-communist uh, emperor in the South, Bao Dai. The United States was at a crossroads concerning Vietnam. Uh, should they recognize the right of Vietnamese to rule themselves? This would have meant allowing Ho to rule. Now Ho was a communist, but he was in many people's mind a nationalist first. America did have a tradition of being anti-colonial. Uh, after all, the American Revolution threw, threw off the yoke of the greatest colonial power of the day, Great Britain. Now the other route for the United States to take after World War II was to support the French in their struggle against Ho. In the post-World War II world, the United States viewed communism as monolithic, meaning it was a worldwide movement with no difference between Russian communism, Chinese communism, or Vietnamese communism. Therefore, it was a bigger threat to world peace than colonialism was. So basically what ended up happening after World War II is Truman decided that it was more important to support the French despite their being a colonial power because they were a strong ally in the fight against communism in Europe, which was seen by many as the more important theater of operations in the Cold War. Uh, to many Americans, Europe is much more important than Asia. Now, um, in May of 1950, uh, Truman ends up giving a lot of money to the French for use in, the, in Indochina against the communists. Like I said, the Korean War starts um, in June of 1950, and it seems all the more important to defeat, de defeat communism. Uh, by the end of 1950, the United States will have given the French $150 million for, dollars for use in Indochina. By the end of 1953, America was paying about 80% of the war costs for France, which was over $1 billion of, a year. That includes things like tanks, planes, fuel, ammunition, napalm. Uh, so basically, America is paying for the French uh, Indochina War. Now, the war does not go well for the French. The Americans would have done well to study the lessons the French learned as they would repeat the same mistakes a decade later. 
The French controlled the cities but could not control the countryside. The French would go on search and destroy missions in the countryside, believing that they had pacified an area, only to find it fall back into communist control once they left. The French relied on French soldiers as they could not count on their Vietnamese allies. Um, the battle that decided France's fate in Vietnam was the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Now, what ended up happening with that battle is the French decided to build a great base at a place called Dien Bien Phu. It was a valley surrounded by mountains, and the goal was to force the Viet Minh to come out and fight the French in a pitched battle, and the French would be victorious. Now, the outcome of this battle is very important because there's a summit going on in Geneva in 1954 where the world powers are deciding the fate of Vietnam. Whichever side wins at Dien Bien Phu will control a better position at the bargaining table at the Geneva uh, summit. So from March to May 1954, the siege and battle of Dien Bien Phu takes place. The French have 10,000 soldiers around Dien Bien Phu. They have airplanes, artilleries, mortars, and tanks, everything you need to fight a conventional war. But Dien Bien Phu is built on a valley floor. It's kind of the lowest point surrounded by mountains. Now tens of thousands of Viet Minh led by General Vo Nguyen Jop. He's gonna be the main uh, general during the Vietnam War, both for the French Vietnam War and for the American Vietnam War coming up. The Viet Minh under his leadership take apart their artillery pieces and carry them up over the mountains and reassemble them on the other side, something the French thought that there was no way they could do. They then began to shell the French base in the valley French planes taking off from the base could not knock out the Viet Minh artillery as they were dug in too well into the mountains. Soon the French air base was knocked out and the base had to be resupplied by parachute. Um, the Viet Minh quickly surrounded the French base. They dug trenches uh, right up to the perimeter and then attacked the base. And after a 55 day battle from March to May 1954, um, they forced the French to surrender at Dien Bien Phu. Now, the French had appealed to Eisenhower to rescue them. They even asked him if he would be willing to use tactical nuclear weapons to bomb the surrounding area at Dien Bien Phu and save the base. But Eisenhower refused to do this. He wasn't willing to use nuclear weapons to bail out the French. And the victory at Dien Bien Phu did strengthen the Viet Minh's position at the Geneva Conference. Um, at that conference, a few things were decided. One, Vietnam would be partitioned at the 17th parallel and unifications elections would take place two years later in 1956. The North would be communist and the South would be anti-communist. The North would withdraw their troops from the South but keep their political operatives in South Vietnam um, to help them prepare for the 1956 elections. So basically, we have two countries now, North Vietnam, which is the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and then South Vietnam, which is the Republic of Vietnam. The leader of the North, like I said, is Ho Chi Minh. Now, eventually, we get a new leader in South Vietnam. His name is No Din Diem, and he's going to be a very important figure. So in October 1954, the Viet Minh march into Hanoi victorious. Um, a lot of people end up fleeing to the south. Um, there's a lot of Catholics in Vietnam because the French had such an influence there for hundreds of years. And in something called Operation Passage to Freedom, approximately one million North Vietnamese move south. Uh, they're mainly Catholics who are fearful that communists will repress them. So they go south um, and No Dinh Diem, he's actually a Catholic Vietnamese leader, so they think he'll protect them. Now, Ziem was appointed Prime Minister of South Vietnam during the Geneva Conference. He was a nationalist, anti-communist, and he was Catholic. He had spent time in America studying at a seminary. He was a very devout Catholic and would often do dishes with his students, even though as a brother at the seminary, he was not required to do this kind of menial labor. As Prime Minister, he relied on family members to help him run the government. Uh, Ziem faced many problems as leader of South Vietnam. Buddhists in the South resented Catholics and saw Ziem as favoring them. Rival generals and politicians threatened Ziem with almost constant rebellion, uh, including one attempt by the head of Saigon secret police, the not notorious ganger Bay Vien, gangster Bay Vien. Uh, he tried to lead a coup against Ziem. Now, also, the army in the South was not an effective fighting force. 
Um, there were assassination attempts both against ZM and South Vietnamese officials. So that's kind of a constant reality in governing South Vietnam. Um, one of ZM's brother, No Dinh Nu, he was D ZM's chief political advisor and head of the secret service or secret police. Um, his wife was uh, Tran Li Xuan. She was referred to as the Dragon Lady. She's a very outspoken woman. She's very interesting, um, as you can kind of see from these pictures. Now, unification elections were supposed to take place in 1956, but those elections were canceled because ZM resisted them. There was a fear that Ho would get 100% of the vote in the North because he's a communist dictator, and ZM was not as popular as Ho. So the United States ended up backing ZM in this, and the elections were canceled. The United States under Eisenhower um, now backed him as the leader of the South and gave him money and military, including uh, weapons. To fight ZM in the South and reunify Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh created the National Liberation Front, or NLF, in 1960. They were basically a communist coalition of anti-ZM forces. ZM called them the Viet Cong or the Vietnamese Communists, and that's kind of what they get, they, they're known by. Um, the Viet Cong decided to go to war against ZM in the United States. Um, so now, from this point on, there's basically four groups fighting. Um, you have American forces and Arvin forces, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. They're fighting on one side, and then you have the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong guerrillas on the other side. Now, to deal with the problem of the Viet Cong's influence in the countryside, ZM introduced something called agrovilles. These were farming communities meant to isolate the rural population from the communists. Now, under JFK, these agrovilles are known as strategic hamlets, and this is basically what their goal was. They were implemented to help the southern peasants defend themselves against the communist fighters. They would bring government authority to villages in the countryside. They would isolate the countryside. You would have friendlies inside the hamlets. You would have enemies outside the hamlets. So you could identify who was on your side. Now, many peasants resented the strategic hamlets because it forced them off their land, uh, land that their families had farmed for centuries and land where their ancestors were often buried. Uh, basically, it's kind of a medieval idea, like a castle with a moat around it. It's very defensible. Um, people inside the strategic hamlet are good. People outside the strategic hamlet are enemies. That's kind of the idea. Now, JFK continued to support ZM um, and South Vietnam in their fight against communism. JFK had seen the developing world as an important theater in the Cold War. After the Bay of Pigs disaster, the tough Vienna summit, and the building of the Berlin Wall, he felt he needed to show strength, and Vietnam was the place to do it. Um, coming out of his terrible summit meeting with Khrushchev, JFK told the journalist James Reston of the New York Times, Now we have a problem in making our power credible, and Vietnam is the place we're going to do it. So basically JFK says, we got to show that we're tough. Let's show we're tough in Vietnam. So um, JFK's strategy in Vietnam was to win the war with military advisors, special forces such as Green Berets, American hardware, and lots of financial assistance. Uh, JFK had numerous advisors to help him out with this. Uh, his advisors were called the best and the brightest. The two most important are Robert McNamara, he's the Secretary of Defense, and then uh, the commander in Vietnam, General William C. Westmoreland. Now one thing JFK does is he steps up the delivery of helicopters to Vietnam. Vietnam is often called a helicopter war, and here's kind of what helicopters do. Uh, one, they carry troops to and from the battlefield, and two, they provide fire for ground troops and other helicopters flying into battle. And I want to look at one operation called Operation Chopper, and this will kind of show you how, how these things were used during JFK's time as president. So Operation Chopper takes place in January 1962. It's the first combat mission flown by these helicopters. In this mission, American pilots fly about a thousand Arvin soldiers to sweep a Viet Cong stronghold near Saigon. This operation is a success as ground and air units work together to find, corner, and destroy the Viet Cong, which they do. 
The Arvin call these tactics finding, cornering, and destroying the Viet Cong units spear and net tactics, but later the Americans call them search and destroy tactics. And here's how it would kind of work. Um, Allied intelligence would locate Viet Cong guerrilla communist uh, fighters. The Viet Cong would then be surrounded on land by Arvin forces uh, and armored personnel carriers and sometimes patrol boats if there's a river nearby. So this is the net surrounding the Viet Cong. Then American choppers would fly Arvin infantry troops to the area and after the Viet Cong were softened up with artillery and air attacks, those Arvin soldiers from the helicopters would move in and attack the Viet Cong. That's the spear. This forced the Viet Cong to give battle as there was no escaping. Um, and this method was very successful for a while. But what often happens in Vietnam is, is you learn to change tactics and that's what the Viet Cong realize they need to do. Um, they start to place machine guns near landing zones in order to ambush the Arvin soldiers when they jump out of the helicopters. Larger units of Viet Cong learn how to break into smaller units and then they learn how to disappear into the jungle as soon as they hear helicopters approaching. So just run away instead of giving battle. Uh, the Viet Cong also learn to keep attacks and ambushes short. Um, all these changes put together helped the Viet Cong avoid defeats like they did, like they faced at Operation Chopper. Um, at the Battle of Op Back in January 1963, the Viet Cong used these tactics and they set a trap for the U.S. and the Arvin forces, and it's a terrible defeat. Um, some 400 Arvin soldiers and three U.S. advisors are killed while only nine Viet Cong die. Um, after this success, the Viet Cong began to escalate their attacks on Xi'an strategic hamlets. Now there's a lot of political chaos in Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. Um, Xi'an's government faces political crisis after crisis in South Vietnam. In the spring of 1963, Buddhists protest Xi'an and his family and their crackdown on Buddhists. Uh, Buddhists were often seen as communist sympathizers, so Xi'an was always cracking down on them. The fo most famous Buddhist protest was that undertaken by uh, Thich Quang Duc. He burns himself alive on June 11, 1963 to protest ZM. The media spread pictures and this creates a problem in America. Basically, America's ally is seen as very repressive. Here's these peaceful monks burning themselves alive. You know, the American public starts to wonder, should we be backing a government that allows this to happen? Um, but what ends up happening is after ZM is ousted, more Buddhist monks burn themselves than when he was in power. Um, but the media ignores this. So basically the problem gets worse after ZM is removed. Um, Madame Nu responds to the burning of the Buddhist monk. She says he basically barbecued himself. Um, you can watch that clip. I've got it in the, in the sh canvas shell. Now, the Buddhists step up their protests, which leads to ZM cracking down even more. Some South Vietnamese military generals begin plotting against ZM. They're also Buddhists. Um, some American officials agree with these generals. Um, ZM declares martial law to deal with the situation. And you get a new ambassador in Vietnam at this time, Henry Cabot Lodge. He replaces Frederick Nolting, who was a ZM ally. Now, JFK makes Henry Cabot Lodge ambassador to Vietnam, um, basically to kind of give himself cover. JFK had defeated Henry Cabot Lodge for the Senate in Massachusetts earlier in his career. Um, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., which is a famous historian who kind of covered F uh, JFK's presidency, he said this, the thought of implicating a leading Republican in the Vietnam mess appealed to his instinct for politics. So. JFK basically says, hey, if I send a Republican to be ambassador in Vietnam, if things go wrong, I can pr provide some cover for myself. W my party won't maybe necessarily get all the blame. Now, towards the end of 1963, JFK gave an interview, and this is what he said about ZM and South Vietnam. There's a lot of pressure to remove ZM, and this is what JFK says. In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them, we can give them equipment, we can send our men out there as advisors, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam against the communists. We're prepared to continue to assist them, 
but I don't think that the war can be won unless the people support the effort. And in my opinion, in the last two months, the government has gotten out of touch with the people. With changes in policy and perhaps within personnel, I think it can be won. If it doesn't make these changes, the government, I would think that the chances of winning it would not be very good. Well, what ends up happening is America consents to a coup against no Din Zian. They don't plan the coup. They just allow the coup to take place. So on November 1st, 1963, South Vietnamese generals move against No Dinh Diem, um, and he's killed on November 2nd, 1963. So he's assassinated. Some people thought that this was going to make the war shorter because they said Diem was a, an inefficient ruler. He was corrupt. He was repressive. Now that he's out of the way, the chances for winning the war are better. Uh, Ambassador Lodge said the prospects now are for a shorter war, um, but others disagreed. Avril Harriman, he was a kind of a an older gentleman who was a kind of a political insider in Washington, kind of part of the establishment. He said this, as you look back on it, ZM was better than the chaotic condition which was to follow. So basically after ZM is killed, things get worse in South Vietnam, and that's actually what happened. Now, um, the traditional kind of normal view of ZM is that he was repressive, corrupt. It was a good thing to get rid of him. But if you read Triumph Forsaken, it argues the opposite. ZM was the best leader the South had. If he would have been allowed to live and rule South Vietnam, they might have won the war. So I want to read you a little bit from Triumph Forsaken. The Buddhist problem, the root cause of ZM's downfall, did not disappear. Although the generals had released all jailed Buddhists following the coup, three Buddhist suicides occurred during the regime's first month in office, and in the four months succeeding Ziem's death, more Buddhists would kill themselves with fire than during all the years of Ziem's rule combined. As time noted, though, these deaths did not receive the intense pub publicity in the Western press um, that had accorded the Buddhist suicides in the Ziem period. So basically, things got way worse, but the media didn't cover them, so it didn't seem like things got worse. And that's one of the criticisms of during the Vietnam War, is that the media kind of helps create this false view of the war and helps lose the war. In their minds, uh, those who overthrow through ZM, a successful South Vietnamese regime needed to tolerate public protests, conduct fair elections, broaden the government, give numerous public speeches and press conferences, and otherwise conduct itself like an American government. Communist sources were to confirm that the government had held the upper hand until the coup and quickly lost it after the coup. In April 1964, reported in the general situation, their southern command would state that the Viet Cong had struggled during 1962 and the first 10 months of 1963. But after November 1st, they began to reestablish themselves in areas where they had been weakened. So basically, ZM had, had held the Viet Cong in check, but then after he died, the Viet Cong started getting the upper hand. Whenever Viet Cong forces injured a strategic hamlet, the history asserted, the government came back the next day to repair the damage. Of the 273 strategic hamlets in the province of Long An, under ZM, the history recounted, only 20 had been put out of order before the coup. In the six months after the coup, virtually all the strategic hamlets throughout Long An province, province were destroyed. The communists, unlike most of the Americans, were very quick to grasp the profound significance of the November 1963 coup. Upon hearing of ZM's assassination, Ho Chi Minh remarked, I can scarcely believe that the Americans would be so stupid. The North Vietnamese Politburo predicted this. The consequence of the November 1st coup will be contrary to the calculations of the U.S. imperialists. ZM was one of the strongest individuals resisting the people and communism. Everything that could be done in an attempt to crush the revolution was carried out by ZM. ZM was one of the most competent lackeys of the U.S. imperialists. The coup on November 1st, 1963 will not be the last. Now, the pro-communist Australian writer Wilfred Burchett, who spent time with the Vietnamese communist leader shortly after the coup, he told an American journalist in late 1964, We never believed the Americans would let ZM go, much less aid and abet his departure. ZM was a national leader and you will never be able to replace him, never.
you haven't had an effective government in Saigon since, and you won't have one uh, anymore. Uh, Burchett said that the Vietnamese communist leaders called the coup a gift and exclaimed that the Americans have done something that we haven't been able to do for nine years, and that was get rid of ZM. So basically, um, the Americans think that this will make things better, but if you look at communist sources or North Vietnamese sources, they were actually glad the coup took place because they were struggling against ZM, who they saw as an effective leader. Now that he's out of the way, they think their job just got easier. Now, uh, ZM is killed at the beginning of November 1963. Fast forward a couple weeks, JFK is assassinated November 2nd, 1963. So JFK dies shortly after ZM. At the time of JFK's death, there were almost 17,000 military advisors in Vietnam. America was spending something like one million a day in support of South Vietnam. Now, some people said that JFK, had he lived, would have uh, listened to reason and gotten out of Vietnam. But let me read you a quote from an interview one month before his death. These people who say that we ought to withdraw from Vietnam are wholly wrong. Because if we did withdraw from Vietnam, the communists would control Vietnam. Pretty soon, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Malaya would go, and all of Southeast Asia would be under control of the communists and under the domination of the Chinese. So that's that domino theory, the fear of the domino theory coming true. So JFK would not have gotten out of Vietnam had he lived. So after JFK dies, Lyndon Baines Johnson becomes president. Now, as you can see, there were only 17,000 American troops in Vietnam when he was killed. But by the end of Johnson's time as president, there would be over 500,000 American troops in Vietnam. That's why we call the Vietnam War Johnson's War, because he escalated it. He Americanized it by sending hundreds of thousands of American soldiers to do the fighting uh, for the Vietnamese. 